This is from uh, national organization. Uh, it's a fundamental organization of the system. Uh, blah blah blah. Um, we're going to go into details of that. But there are many definitions of what exactly it means. Um, if you Google for software or Postgres architecture, you will get a lot of pretty pictures and uh, so forth. I actually have any diagrams in this uh, presentation. I was going to, but uh, just somehow I ended up not having it. Uh, the point is that uh, software architecture definition is it's not a single diagram because there's always multiple things you want to look at. Like, I'm going to cover what processes Postgres has and how does the memory management work and what is the, what's in shared memory. Uh, but you could also take a look at how the source code is organized or how, you, you know, how does the client and the server communicate and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot of different viewpoints you could take. Uh, in nutshell, software architecture is just something, you know, it's the same thing as software design, just a higher level. Uh, and it is just a software architect that decides which things are important. And this presentation is based on my opinions, and I just picked a few things that I find important that I usually work on. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of other things that are important to different people, uh, but this is just based on some things I haven't picked. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, just feel free to raise your hand and drop. Uh, we will also have some time at the end for questions. Um, so software architecture is all about you know, trying to achieve some non-functional requirements. And what we mean by non-functional requirements is things like data integrity. It's very important for Postgres that you don't lose your data. We care a lot about that. Uh, so we make some decisions based on that on how we make it reliable so you don't lose your data. And there's things like performance. You know, you probably want to perform well. You want it to scale well so that you have 100 cores on the user server and you can make use of all of that. In Postgres, we also care about scaling down. If you take the stock Postgres installation, the defaults in your config file are tuned for like a tiny little server. And that's by design also. Postgres, you can run Postgres on tiny machines. I have a Raspberry Pi running in, in my bookshelf at home. It's running, it's a field farm member called Chipmunk. If you go to the field farm page, uh, that's running you know, without a box. It's just a plain or with the Ethernet connection on it, and it runs Postgres every, every, every night. It does build and it works fine. It used to run it on 256 megs. That was a little bit tight, but it ran. Now I have I've upgraded to 512 megabytes RAM, and it works perfectly. Um, so scalability, we care about scaling up, but we also care, care about scaling down. Uh, reliability, in this case, could mean a lot of things. I mean, you know, if something goes wrong, the system keeps running, you know, as far as it's safe to do so without, again, corrupting your data. Uh, we care about interoperability. We follow the SQL standard. We try to, you know, be interoperable between versions, for example. We also care a lot about portability. Uh, you can run Postgres on all kinds of strange hardware. We think we used to have a PlayStation in the group on. We don't anymore. Uh, I don't know what happened to that. But you can run it on Raspberry Pi, you can run it on all kinds of strange architectures. You have HP UX blocks running in there, I think. And uh, we're just having discussions on the list right now about uh, re architecting some uh, low level spin locks and atomic operations. And we're having discussions like do we still need to support Spark version 8 that was released in 1998? Uh, I think most people are now agreeing that we don't. But we're sitting. We're, you know, we're having even a serious discussion of whether we still need to support these things. So Postgres is very portable with all kinds of servers, and we also support Windows, which is one of the, uh, you know, that's one of the more difficult ports, uh, working with different CPU architectures. Uh, and we care highly about extensibility. Postgres has, you know, you can extend it in so many ways. You can build your own data types, you know, with your own functions. But you can also write your functions in all kinds of different languages, Perl, Python. And if you invent a new programming language, you can create your PL handler so that you can write your functions in that new language. Uh, so well, I, I hope someone will write PL languages for Go and whatnot. There are all kinds of new interesting languages coming up. Uh, I don't think anyone has done that yet, but uh, so that would be completely doable. Uh, we could care about maintainability. We reject a lot of patches that improve performance, for example, if it makes the code mess. 
or it improves some you know, uh, scalability or whatnot, but it makes the code more difficult to understand. We, you know, we care about that. We reject patches on the grounds that <laughs> it's difficult to read. And we care about you know, code comments. The book is so pretty, it's very nice to read. Um, so these are kind of the values of the community on you know, whether a patch is accepted or not, or what do we use in the board on. It's kind of these kind of things. I'm sure I left out something like Postgres gave a whole presentation on security. I didn't think of that. But <laughs> that's one of those things that we have designed into the architecture that you can then implement all these features that you know, make it secure or whatnot. Uh, so just as one example, you know, Postgres is very extensible. You can create your own operators like plus, minus, divided by, or you can invent your own names for them. And you can define what data types it works on, and then you implement it by using a function. And we use this for even all of the building types. So for example, if you look at the implementation of the less than operator for plain integers, Postgres, every time you use the less than operator, it goes and calls this function. It's within the, it's built in into the system. It's not an extension or anything, but it goes through all the same kind of go paths that you would if it was an extension. All the built-in types are exactly the same as kind of data types you can write your own. Uh, there are no exceptions to, or very few exceptions to how we handle building data types or we handle your own data types. Plug in. Um, and that makes it very extensible. That's, that's basically what makes things like post GIS possible, where you have build your own data types and you can, you can represent points or graphs or whatever, and the system will work fine with them. You just have to define the behavior. I mean, what does it mean? What, what kind of operators do mean make sense for points? Is, the, you know, is it within a box or outside a box? Why, while for an integer you have less than greater than uh, and so forth. Uh, it's up to you to decide what these things mean. And Postgres doesn't care, it will just call your functions based on the rules you give it. You know, what do these mean? Uh, of course, when you're, when you're you know, hacking on Postgres, it means that you, <laughs> you can't assume anything at all about the data types. You always have to go through these functions. For example, there is no special case code for sorting integers. If you have a table with an ID, integer ID, column, uh, it's actually pretty slow compared to many other databases because we don't have anything special for them. It goes through the same kind of hoops that you would if it was a point or if it was a, a long blob of text. We use the exact same code class to deal with integers. Um, of course, it's, you know, integers are always, it's always small and they're fixed size, so we know about that and we take advantage of that. But you can write your own fixed size data types and you will get the same benefits. Uh, so it's a trade off. Uh, it makes it very extensible and it makes it possible to write post GIS and many other extensions that use these things. But it also means that you know, building data types can be as slow as extensions in a way. There are no um, fat, fast paths for them. Uh, that was kind of just an introduction on what these non-functional requirements mean. Uh, so I'm going to do next. I'm going to go through some of the processes that Postgres has. Um, so if you probably know, Postgres consists of multiple processes, and they communicate with each other, and they communicate with the client. Uh, so we, when you start up Postgres, the first thing that it launches is the Postmaster process. That's the as the name says, it's the master of all these other different processes. And uh, for every every connection to the system, the postmaster launches a new backend process. So there's always one process in the server for every connection. When you connect the server, it launches a new process for that connection. And that makes it very scalable in the sense that you know if you have 100 connections, you will end up with 100 processes in the server, and each one of them can take advantage of one CPU or four. Um, so that makes it pretty scalable. Um, then we have all of auxiliary processes or additional processes that are not attached to any connection. Uh, we have all uh, the stuff related to auto vacuum. Whenever auto vacuum runs, it launches a new process to handle that. Uh, then we have a few stuff like background writer, um, all this lot of stuff there. Uh, 
as a new feature in, I think it was 9.3, we have the ability that you can write your own background for your processes. If you want to extend Postgres so that there's a new process that we just dust off in the background, maybe if you want to write a scale like cron, or if you're building your own replication system that needs to have something running in the server all the time, uh, you should write it as a custom background worker uh, so that it works like any other process in the system. Um, so when you launch Postgres, you will see these processes. Uh, in this case, you can see the checkpoint or the background writer and so forth. Um, you can just, you know, the regular in these processes, you can see how much CPU time you're spending or you know, which process is busy and so forth. Um, so about post, Postmaster. So that's the master for the processes. Uh, it doesn't do much, it does very little. It's just whenever a new connection comes in, it launches a new back, back end process to handle that. Uh, and it also handles the death of the agile processes. So whenever you disconnect, uh, Postmaster will notice that, hey, this back end process died, and it will check, well, did it clean up after itself? And uh, if the back end process did not clean up nicely, it crashed. Then the postmaster will realize, oh, oops, one of these backend processes is crashed, and we don't know what it's doing. It might have been in the middle of modifying a page or doing something dangerous. So it will shut down the whole system so that you don't lose your data or you don't corrupt your data. Uh, so that's very important for uh, you know, data integrity that you have this postmaster process that will shut down the system relatively safely if something goes wrong. Uh, so for the postmaster process itself, it's very important that it's reliable because we rely on that to be there. If something else goes wrong, the postmaster is responsible for killing everyone else and shutting down the system safely. Uh, so it's very important that uh, the postmaster never dies itself. Uh, if it will, then the backend processes will notice that and they will kill themselves eventually. Uh, but the better way to do it is to have the postmaster realize that something went wrong and shut down the system safely. Uh, that is why uh, the postmaster process, it's attached to the shared memory, technically, but it never does anything interesting to the shared memory. It just doesn't touch the shared memory. Again, the reason for that is reliability, because if it, the postmaster process went around the shared memory doing stuff, there would be, it would be more likely that a bug you know, makes the postmaster crash, and we don't want that to happen. Or also, there is no locking between postmaster and the other processes. Again, for the same reason that it could happen that one of the backends crash or hang, and then we would have a postmaster blocking on that, and it would also hang. We don't want that to happen. Uh, so the postmaster only looks at the processes and doesn't you know, communicate much with the other processes. And it's very small, it uses very little memory, and it's very little code. Uh, the normal backend processes, set the one one per connection. Um, backend processes themselves, they communicate using shared memory with other processes. So there's a large sized you know, area of shared memory that I'm, I'm going to go into more details of that. There's a large chunk of shared memory that the backend processes use to communicate with each other. Uh, but the basic life cycle of the backend process is that the postmaster launches it when you connect. It, the backend will authenticate the client, and after that, after it has you know, done the basic authentication, like where did, where did this connection come from, is there a role for this in the PGA, uh, pghpa.com, um, just the basic stuff. It will then attach the database that the client wanted to connect to. It's part of the starter packet uh, that the client sends. And after it's attached to the database and verified that you know, you're allowed to connect to that database, you can then start to execute queries. And we'll just go into a loop where query comes in from the client, executes it, sends the result back, and then the next query sends the result back. Uh, until it's time to disconnect. When the client disconnects or you know, something goes wrong in the backend, it will shut itself down. It will detach from shared memory uh, so that the postmaster sees that it was a clean shutdown, and then it will exit. And when you launch a new connection, then you back and forth the spawn. Uh, then there are a few special processes. When you do crash recovery, if, if your system crashes or you pull the power plug, uh, when you want to start it up again, the postmaster will first <coughs> start up uh, what we call a startup process. It's kind of similar to a normal backend process, but it 
only runs once, then you just start up the system. And what it will do is it will read the well, first it will read the control file that's in, uh, in the data directory, which contains some basic information like you know which version is this data directory, so that if you try to launch it you know, against the wrong version, it will complain. And it will read basic stuff like well, what is the locale and encoding and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but more importantly, it contains the pointer to play this checkpoint. And it will determine if you need to do well recovery, if you need to read the logs. Uh, and then it will go ahead and read the logs and replay all the all the do all the well recovery it needs to. And then that's the responsibility of the startup process. It doesn't do much else. Now, once it's done with the startup with the well recovery, the startup process will exit. And the postmaster notices that okay, the startup process guy will check the return code and if it was successful, then it will launch the rest of the system and start to listen to connections. Uh, so the startup process is responsible for bringing the system up to the point that it's safe for the clients to connect. Uh, if you run stream replication or, or any kind of replication, uh, you will see the startup process running all the time because you're continuously in recovery. Applying the logs as they arrive. Uh, so, in that case, the startup process will be there until you promote the server. At that point, the startup process will uh, exit and let the system open up for a bit of right connections. Then we have a few more processes. You can see the background writer and the wall writer. Uh, these are kind of not that important. They're not attached to any particular database. The, the only reason these exist is performance. Uh, the background writer scans the buffer pool and the, the writes out the dirty pages. And the purpose of that is that whenever a backend needs to read in something, otherwise the, the buffer pool would be just full of dirty pages. And now the backend has to write the dirty page first to make a room for a new one. So the background writer just goes and scans and flushes out these buffers. But if you, for example, suspend that process or it somehow hangs, the system will continue to function fine. And uh, in many cases, you probably won't even notice. Uh, it just means that the backends have to do more work that otherwise the background, the background worker would do. Uh, the wall writer is similar. Its only responsibility is to check if new wall records have been generated and to flush them. Now, regular backends will do the same thing. If they write and there is no room in the wall buffers, they will also flush it to this. Or whenever you comment, the normal back, backends will also flush it. So again, this is not critical. It does the same work as a regular backend will. It has to. But if you do like a bulk load, it's better to have a separate process doing the flushing so that the normal backends don't have to wait to do that. So that's just for performance reasons. Uh, not very critical processes. Um, then we have a bunch more. Uh, we have the stats collector that is responsible for collecting uh, counter information from backends, like whenever you run a query. We keep a count of how many queries have been run and how many transactions have been processed. If you look at the PG stats, uh, PG stat, uh, what's it called? PG stat something, uh, you can see these comments. And it's the one that collects the information for each index and keep how many index scans have been made. Uh, it works kind of, that, that's kind of special. Uh, it's not connected to shared memory. Uh, It's not. At least it doesn't do much. The way the stats are collected is that uh, the other backends will send a message using it. Uh, it will send actually a UDP message to the stats collector that contains you know, new, new information, and the stats collector will accumulate the, the messages from all of the backends. Uh, so that one doesn't go to the CRM memory. And the reason for that is, is that if the stats collector for some reason hangs or doesn't keep up if there's so much activity, uh, the UDP messages, the operating system will start just start to drop them on the board. And so the normal backends will never block because they couldn't send the statistics. Because we don't care so much about the statistics. If, if the system is completely busy, we want the backends to continue working and we'd rather you know, skip some statistics than stop, stop uh, processing your actual queries. Uh, the logging collector is kind of similar. Uh, whenever you backend needs to write something to the logs, you go to the login collector and you have to disable that in the configuration file. And 
anyone does that nowadays. So whenever someone one packet needs to put the log, message to the log, it will send it to the login collector, which will write the logs. And then we all, yeah, then we also have while archive. If you enable while archiving, uh, we will every now and we'll launch a while archiving process which wakes up every now and then and calls the it's called the archive command. That's the only responsibility of that process. And again, the reason it's a separate process is reliable because if it's calling a, you know, any random command you gave it, so we don't want the rest of the system to crash or anything if that command you gave it is broken. So that's why it's a separate process. If that dies, Postmaster will just launch a new one. <coughs> so that's about the processes. Uh, I'm going to continue with the shared memory. We have, as I said, backends use shared memory to communicate with each other. Uh, it's allocated when you launch the system. It's fixed size. It doesn't grow or shrink after you start it up. And uh, it's divided into a lot of small areas. But like 99% of the shared memory is used for the shared buffers. And that's what you said in the your config file. That's like most of the memory actually goes to that. But there is a lot of other stuff, small stuff in shared memory that the backends use to communicate with each other. And we use something called lightweight logs to protect these areas. Uh, so about the buffer pool, it consists of eight kilobyte pages, and uh, each buffer can hold one page. This could be, you know, you read on how, how do you implement buffers in operating systems or databases. This is really common stuff. Uh, each buffer can be logged in the right mode. And these are really low level buffers. This is, it contains them just the exact image of what is on this. Um, yeah, that's struck up there. Someone needs to look it up. That's what we store for each buffer in addition to the real data that's in uh, There's some blocks and stuff. Uh, but there are other, other important stuff. Besides the buffers in shared memory, we have what we call a prop array. So every process, every backend process, uh, that we launch have to, has a slot in this array we call a prop array. And it records some, some basic information about that process that, that other processes need to look at. Like what, what database is this connected to? Uh, what's the process ID? You know, if you do PS and you look at the processes in your system, which process is this? Uh, and what transaction ID is working on? And then we have some stuff for participating in logging. Uh, also, this is used when, when you run queries to see which transactions are running at the moment so that you can get a consistent snapshot. It scans the whole array and collects all the XIDs of what's running at the moment. Uh, there's all kinds of random little things in there, like is this process running vacuum at the moment? Sometimes you need to know that. There's small flags like that. Whatever a backend needs to publish about itself, it's, it's usually the uh, and as I mentioned, this is really small. It's like less than one kilobyte per connection. Uh, it's tiny compared to the share, share of buffers. But it's very important, very central concept in the back. Uh, other thing is we have a log manager. Uh, whenever you do queries on tables, this is what prevents. So if you have one backend running a query on table, it logs the table. Not, not in an exclusive way, you know, other processes can access it. But it prevents other backends from dropping the table. <coughs> uh, and that's that's what we have in the config file for max logs per transactions and max connections. It's, uh, that specifies how much space we reserve for that. Again, it's fixed size. So if you run queries that access thousands of tables in every query, you might run out of space and you get an error message. Uh, we have a data log detector for that. And then we have a lot of random other stuff in shared memory, like uh, whenever you run it, whenever you run the checkpoint command, it's not that process that does the checkpoint. There's a separate checkpoint process, so there's a little bit of memory reserved for communication with that, and a uh, bunch of other stuff. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, but there's a lot of tiny little areas in shared memory for random purposes. And then we have some other caches there, like there's a cache for a lot of others, the right ahead log. C log, and these are all directories you can see in the data directory uh, subdirectories there. And they are all handled similarly. They're small buffers, tiny compared to the shared buffers, but we call them both back. 
you know, take all crypto transactions on some piece of and stuff. Uh, so another area we have in shared memory is something that we use to communicate with the postmaster. I said earlier that the postmaster doesn't touch shared memory. Uh, it's not really true, it does a little bit. So there's a tiny little area that's reserved for communicating with the postmaster. And, and there's no looking there, it's very simple, just some flags uh, signals. Uh, so we have that in shared memory. And then we have what we call shared cache invalidation for you know, invalidating back and private caches. And yeah, we have a lot in there. Uh, we have three levels of logs. I'm not going to go into detail. We have spin logs that are used to implement lightweight logs. And lightweight logs are what usually protects all of these shared memory areas. And, but they're also used to implement the heavy logs. Anyway. What's important to notice is what we don't have in the shared memory. There is no plan cache, for example, in the shared memory. Uh, this surprises a lot of people. If you run a prepared statement in one connection, it's going to run the optimizer and it's going to create generate the plan. But that's held within the backend. It's not shared with other backends. Uh, many other databases do it differently. Uh, but in Postgres, it's per backend. Uh, other thing we have is what we call a catalog cache. Uh, we cache information about operators, functions, tables, indexes, whatever you need to access. Uh, because the shared buffer cache that we talked about earlier, that's very low level. It only contains you know, the raw images of the pages on disk. It's very low level. Uh, but these catalog caches, we parse the information a little bit more and we know we have internal structures, complicated structures with pointers and stuff like that to have more information on the indexes and what table is related to and so forth. It's a lot more high level. And uh, obviously, org memory is not in shared memory. Uh, but this means that the structures we have in shared memory are very simple. It's kind of they have to because it's fixed size, so you can't dynamically allocate memory easily and move things around. Uh, but it's also, it makes it very difficult to work with sometimes, but it's also a blessing because it forces you to keep things simple in shared memory. And that's important so that if the one backend crashes, it doesn't affect the other backends. So, comes the third part I'm going to cover is stuff we have in back and private memory. This is not shared. Uh, what we have in back and private memory is I mentioned you know, local caches of the information on the tables and indexes, we have that. Uh, data types functions, so forth, and yeah, it's the same stuff. Uh, but to invalidate these things, we have the thing I mentioned earlier, this is a shared cache invalidation. So whenever you drop a function or an operator or a table, what we send that backend broadcasts a message in shared memory to all the other backends saying, you know, I did something to this table. If you have that table in your private cache, you want to invalidate that because the table might not be there anymore. Uh, so whenever something changes in these caches, we send out the invalidation to the shared memory. Uh, back and private memory is not fixed size. Shared memory is fixed size, but back and private memory is very flexible. But we have what we call memory contexts. Uh, memory contexts are hierarchical, so that we have a top memory context that contains everything. And within that, we have a per transaction context. And that contains stuff that's important for the transaction. And within that, we have a context for query level stuff, and within that, for role level stuff. And this makes memory management really easy. Uh, when you write backend code, you usually don't need to worry about freeing anything because it goes into the memory context, and that will be automatically just zapped at the end of whatever you're doing. And it also means that it's pretty easy to actually write C functions, you know, extensions in C in Postgres. We have a lot of infrastructure like memory management that you know if you write your own C application scratch, it's complicated stuff to get right, and you will have memory leaks very easily. But if you do it in Postgres, if you write writing C extensions in Postgres, it's most, much more like writing Java code or whatever. It's easy to work with. Uh, so yeah, you can see that we have this hierarchy. If you ever run out of memory, uh, Postgres will print out this in your log. Uh, I hope it never happens to you, but it does sometimes. Mm -hmm. You sometimes run out of memory, and we handle that very nicely. Um, 
So you can see kind of where, where the memory goes. This one was from a backend that was just running one very small query. Uh, so there isn't very much there. Uh, but you can see that it's a hierarchy. Another thing we have, it's we're nice, we have very nice error handling. We have whenever something goes wrong in the backend, we just throw an error. And this is exactly like C or Java exceptions, really. You throw an error and it never returns to what you were doing. It jumps back to your error handler that will roll back the transaction automatically, re re release all the logs you were holding, it will release all the memory that you were holding. So again, it's very much like writing Java or C code, not plain C code. And that's very nice. And then we have more serious error. If something goes seriously wrong, you can kill the whole backend. Uh, but the rest of the system runs. And then we have panics, which you hopefully will never to see. If something goes seriously, seriously wrong, then you can panic and bring down the whole server. Um, so, in summary, it's very easy to work on the backend because we have these memory contexts. We have very robust error handling. It's very easy to write C code in the backend. Usually, you don't need to worry about shared memory at all if you write your own code because it will just all run in the backend and uh, all the difficult stuff. And that makes it really robust when you write your own C extension. Uh, so kind of, that's all I have. It could go on forever. It's a broad topic. Uh, just, just some basic stuff I want to cover. Uh, questions? Yes. yes. Send some information from a trigger, for example, to a background worker. Uh, we have a few options. You can allocate your own shared memory stuff. I listed all those little things for different purposes. That was kind of the internal stuff, but you can also allocate in your extension. You can allocate your own small size uh, block of shared memory and use that to communicate. Uh, so it's a bit tricky to send the message, then you have to you know, worry about. Yeah, you have to size it right and what do you do if it's full and so forth. But in 9, I think in 9.4 we have something called dynamic shared memory, uh, which isn't currently used for anything. But it, you can use it in your extension and I think we have a, like a queue implementation there. It can actually send message and have something to do with it. Uh, it would actually be, if you're free to do that, it would be good to look at that because I don't think anyone is using it at the moment. So it would be good for someone to use it so that we know it's any good. Uh, so please take a look at that. But you can also send signals, using just signals between processes, if that's all you need to wake someone up. But, yeah. Hi. Uh, for what reasons uh, uh, did you, are you not caching plans? Uh, why are you caching plans only for connection? connection? Well, it's usually easier just to work in back and private memory because then you can easily have pointers and it's dynamic, you don't care how large it is. Shared memory is fixed size, so then you run into problems like you know, if you run out of memory, what do you do? Uh, so it's just generally much easier to work within the back end than in shared memory. That's, that's the main reason. But isn't it, doesn't it affect performance for, the, for other connections yes. uh, that could use uh, the plans? Sure, yeah, yeah, it's a trade off. If, if it was shared, then a new back when a new backend won't stop it giving new plans. Yes, and it also means that you waste more memory if you have 100 connections and they all have the same plan in, in their own cache. You lose some or it's wasted memory basically. But it's a trade off. Usually they're very small, so you don't really care. And if you are using prepared statements, right, you just plan them once when the backend launches and then you know you reuse them a million times, so it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's a, one of the reasons with Postgres you really want to use a connection pool or you know, not launch one connection, run one query and kill it, because that gets expensive. Because all of these caches are within backend private memory, that's a big reason why it's so slow to launch a new process. Thank you very much, it was very interesting. Uh, I have a question uh, related to uh, process architecture. Yeah. 
Um, as I see, there is not much uh, parallel stuff you can do in Postgres. You have, you may have several uh, vacuum uh, workers, slaves, but you mm, don't have several background writers or wall uh, recovery process. And yeah. why? Uh, no, like the background, background writer, it's usually very idle. There is no need to scale it, go have multiple ones. Because if it blocks, because that means that you're busy writing with doing the I.O., so it wouldn't help to have multiple ones. Uh, same with the while writer, if that blocks, uh, it means that it's actually flushing stuff to this, and the disk is way, way slower than you know, how fast it can send stuff to this. So for those two things, you, know, you don't need it. Uh, for the startup process, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, that, is, that is something we will hopefully address at some point. Uh, it's true, the wall recovery is single thread, it's single process running a single thread. So if you, if we could speed that up a lot if we had multiple processes doing it in parallel. It's kind of pretty difficult because there can be dependencies between different wall records, so you need some bookkeeping to make it work. Uh, but hopefully we'll do that eventually. And it will, could be, it would be doable, it would just have multiple startup processes and then they would communicate and decide who does what. There's no fundamental <coughs> reason we couldn't do it, but it's a lot of programming. And it hasn't been necessary up to this point. Uh, thank you. And the second question is related to interprocess communication. Yeah. Uh, you have mentioned uh, lightweight spin locks. Uh, it's something like uh, Oracle latches, indexes. Uh, yes? Yeah. The mutex is, yeah. Not sure what turn I, I mean, uh, does process really spins on the CPU and not yeah. yields it? So the lowest level locks are spin locks, and yeah, you really do spin, you know, it's a busy way to loop. Uh, but we use that only to protect like very short, you know, few lines of code, very short segments. And we use those to implement the higher level locks. The lightweight locks are different, they are, we have proper queuing for them in the view sleep and we have shared and exclusive modes and they are really handy. Uh, we don't have deadlock detection for them and we don't need to usually only have all the few locks at the same time. Um, there. Yeah. And then we use those locks to implement the even higher level locks for the heavyweight teams. In 9.5 uh, Andres Freund is working on atomic operations so the lightweight locks will hopefully use those. Uh, system platforms that support them that basically make them more scalable. That's what it's all about. And in some cases, you can get rid of the spin lock if you can use an atomic operation, just a single like, assembler or instruction instead. But we'll see where that goes. But please tell us something more in detail about uh, change state for 9.1. Both future future of future architecture um, 9.4 9.5. Yeah, so there has been anything. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> so what are we gonna do in the future? Uh, I can't think of much. Uh, I think in the future Robert Haas is working on doing parallel query. Uh, that will, for example, if it's the same architecture, uh, we're just gonna have more processes that are like worker processes, and they will communicate through shared memory with the backend processes. Doesn't really change the overall you know, big picture. It stays the same. I can't think of any big architectural changes coming up. That's a, usually a good sign that the architecture is good. You don't need to change it. Okay. <laughs> More questions? Um, not. Thank you. And I'm going to be here around for. Yeah, I think you thank you for coming to Russia to St. Petersburg to speak at our conference.